Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. Rev 250 is a consortium of about 70 groups in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution. I am Bob Allison. I chair the advisory group, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for our conversation today with Stacy Shipp. Thanks for joining us, Stacy. Thanks for having me, Bob. And Stacey Schiff is a phenomenal author. She has written books about Vera Nabokov, for which she received a Pulitzer Prize, about Saint Exupery, which was a Pulitzer finalist. And she is currently writing a book about um, Samuel Adams. She's also written about Cleopatra, that is a wide range of subjects. And our subject today is her book, A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America. Thank you for joining us, Stacey, to talk about Franklin, France, and that extraordinary episode. I should also say that this book received the George Washington Book Prize, as well as the Gilbert Chouinard Prize from the Institute, the French American Institute. I would try to pronounce the French name for it, but it would embarrass all of us, as well as the Ambassador Award in American Studies. And the Economist called this one of the one of the best books of the year. I have to say it is one of the best books about Franklin I've ever read. So thank you for joining us. Thanks. That's very kind of you. So what brought you to write this wonderful book about Franklin and the French um, French negotiations? I, you know, I think like many of us, I came to Franklin through the autobiography, um, which if you don't realize that his tongue is wedged in his cheek can seem like a dry or mystifying book in many ways. And I think I went back to it and thought, what a humorous you know, tour de force this was. And I was struck by the writing style, which then left me, left me reading Franklin and marveling at the lucidity of the prose. I mean, he's really just a crystalline stylist, um, as he well knew. And then I started thinking about the parts of his life, the chapters of the life and how they fell out. And as you will remember in the autobiography, he writes off the, all, the entire French adventure as two Fra- four words, to France, period, treaty, period, etc. Yeah, I sort of, you know, that was like the, the red bull to the, you know, to, to, to the, the red flag to the bull there. I was like, right, yeah. you write those nine years down in four words. Yeah. Um, and he really considered it the greatest achievement of his life. It was certainly the greatest challenge. It was the, it was the ending act and, and really the most forcefully demanding one. And I, that I just kind of fell hook, line and sinker into the archives. Yes. It's a phenomenal story. And it's important because he's a... 70 when he goes to France, his health isn't good. And he had just had this really disastrous term in England in the early 1770s. And then this really is, it's not only one of the high points of his life, it's actually one of the high points in American diplomacy, what Franklin was able to achieve during his eight years in Paris. And he really puts America on the map. It's the first time, obviously it's the first time America is recognized as a nation. Um, but when Franklin goes to France, um, I mean, I should back up first of all and say he's chosen because he seems like the obvious man for the job. He's the only member of that generation. He's the only American with any real experience of foreign affairs. He's been in London for 15 years. He's been to France twice. It is dimly and falsely understood that he speaks French. Um, you know, he basically says, oh, it's the, you know, I have nothing to lose. I'm 70. Make, do with me, with me what you will. But from the French point of view, he's the ideal man for the job because he is, of course, the, the tamer of the lightning, the frontier philosopher, the, the much, much admired Dr. Franklin, a, man, a great celebrity. So when he arrives in France, he is this kind of walking statue of liberty. He is this, this you know, he puts Charles Lindbergh to shame in the sense that his celebrity is so great. Mm. But he really is doing this um, with very little input from Congress which we can talk about, but he's really talking to a people who don't understand where America is or what it is and think of it as about as important as Corsica. So it really is this sense of, you know, sort of founding a nation in the eyes of the rest of the world. Mm. Yeah. And he very much seems to be playing a role with the fur cap and the simplicity and which the French really, the French highly stylized court life, they really embrace this idea that he seems to be presenting. You know, the, the, the fur hat, which is a Martin fur hat, you know, I'm still hoping somebody's going to write it and tell us more about this hat. I spent a lot of time on the hat. 
I don't know if he was wearing that hat. We, we've never seen any other 18th century figure wearing a hat like that. It's not like the Davy Crockett hats we all had as kids. So was he, did he happen to put it on because he was cold? You know, it would have been a cold crossing in December 1776 to get to France. Did he put it on because he knew it would have this dramatic effect in France of, of making him appear like he was a rustic philosopher? I mean, Franklin spent his entire life in cities. He didn't yes. know anything about the rustic world. Or did he have it on his head because he had psoriasis and he was trying to keep himself from scratching? I mean, we'll never know. Yeah. The hat, which, yes, the Martin Fur hat, which the Tories make great fun of, um, immediately sets off a hairstyle in France, which is an imitation of Franklin's headgear because he is perceived to be essentially something that just walked out of the pages of Rousseau with this ridiculous hat. Yeah. And he, he tells his daughter that his image, his face is as familiar as the man in the moons in France because there's so many prints made of him and little statues made of him that as he becomes, he had been a celebrity, but this really does seem to accelerate that. I mean, he really is, you know, the, the first rock star in the sense that there are images of him on walking sticks, on ashtrays, on mugs, on wallpaper. I mean, his face is immensely well known. He couldn't go anywhere in the streets um, without attracting a huge cheering crowd because his face was so well known. And when he says that to his daughter, he says it, it's an interesting remark because he, he sounds like he's complaining in a way, mm -hmm. but he doesn't ever hesitate to sit for the portraitists either. Right. Um, although you could argue that his celebrity is one of the greatest things in his arsenal in terms of um, campaigning on America's behalf. I mean, he really does use the celebrity to tremendous negotiating advantage. He does, yes. And then he has interesting relationships with both French and fellow Americans while he is in Paris. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of these people whom, who, with whom his life intersects, like Madame Brion, the neighbor who is also a very accomplished musician. And um, Franklin and Madame Brion and her family strike up a close relationship. Can you speak a little bit about her and what she's up to? Happily, she, Madame Brion and her family live, they're, one of, they're among his closest neighbors. When Franklin gets to France, it is, it is clear that his celebrity is so great that he can't really remain in central Paris because he's mobbed at all times. And moreover, the ministers at Versailles don't want him easily accessible because he's subject to too many machinations. So he moves to what is today the 16th, the western part of Paris, which, which was then a little village called Passy. And down the street from him live this very charming family. Um, Madame Brion is the initial point of contact. She's in her 30s, early 30s. She's the mother of, of several children, married to a much older man, unhappily, or at least happily until she discovers that he's having an affair with the governess, um, and who takes, who, whom immediately ingratiates herself with Franklin and becomes terrifically close friends in an immensely flirtatious way. So that whenever, um, Whenever Franklin needs, he, he sees her twice a week. He visits the household constantly, and it's really almost a second home to him. But if you really want to see sort of Franklinian logic at its best, um, you look at the letters to Madame Brion because it's it's a constant um, sort of headbutting, again headbutting race against the rules. You know, she goes at one point um, on a long trip, and he says, "I hope in your travels you might." managed to have the Ten Commandments revoked because I find them very inconvenient, especially the one about coveting your neighbor's wife. Hmm. Um, you know, at one point she complains that he's being too attentive to other women. And, you know, in typical Franklin fashion, he answers that a man who is constant to many women is obviously more constant than a man who's constant only to one. So there's this, there's this very witty banter between the two of them. Um, she spends a lot of time sitting on his lap. There's a certain exchange of kisses. Um, there's a lot of stuff which John Adams in particular will find very objectionable, but which is playful um, and by the style of um, the French 18th century, not completely out of bounds. Mm. And what about Madame Helvetius, whom he seems to want to marry? I, I think that's a pretty clear um, marriage proposal there. Madame Helvetius is this much older woman, the widow of a um, the famous philosopher, very rich, extremely eccentric, a little blousy, um, not as not as refined a creature as Madame Brion, mm -hmm. but un, sort of un, in an unhinged way, um, very eccentric and extremely effusive. She lives in a household filled with um, many animals and most memorably with 18 Angora cats, which she outfits in little brocade costumes. Um, 
And she's, she's this enormous presence and Franklin really is smitten with her. And she's the one person who will outpace him in correspondence. Um, I mean, whom he will outpace in correspondence. He really can't seem to get enough of her. And when he does come back to America, obviously at that point somewhat debilitated and quite old, he will say that her afternoons are the ones that he really, that he really misses. Mm. Um, but it's she who really um, astonishes the Adamses when they, when they yes. arrive, because it's she who arrives at Franklin's house with her little lap dog, um, who immediately has an accident on the floor, which she wipes up with her sleeve, much to the consternation oh. at the very least of Abigail Adams. Yeah, Abigail was shocked because Franklin had said, "This is one. This is one of the best women in France." And Abigail is shocked at this. This is one of the best women. What are the? What are the other ones like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's amazing yeah. What, goes, what goes down in history, isn't it? That that should be the single, the single moment that Abigail should record of the relationship with Madame Hedvigius. Yes. It really is. Yeah, we're talking with Stacy Schiff, author of a great improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America, and. Franklin does become a cultural figure in France. And then he has these um, relationships with uh, lots of these, uh, well, Madame Helvetius, Madame Brion are probably among the most interesting of these French women. And we've mentioned the Adamses and John Adams is quite shocked at a lot of what he sees in France. And again, uh, one reason Adams looms very large in any like this is he, he writes a lot and Abigail writes a lot and their letters have been saved so there they are you know but John Adams and Benjamin Franklin don't really get along very well I, I think that's very diplomatic of you Bob um they're they're really oil and water with each other yeah from the get going part of it is a problem with timing I mean, John Adams arrives for the first time to negotiate a treaty of amity and commerce which has already been negotiated so he's a little late to the show and the second time John Adams arrives in Paris to negotiate a peace and he's two years early. So mm -hmm. part of this is that he's, and, and, and because of both of those incidents, he has a lot of time on his hands. Yeah, um, and for Adams, that's always a dangerous thing. Dangerous, because he always has a pen in his hand, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, his, he has no immediate portfolio and he spends that time complaining really about the dissipation of Dr. Franklin. Yes. Um, but it really is a matter of style. I mean, they, they will obviously come to terms to some extent. Mm -hmm. Classic, um, you have a classic overachiever in John Adams. You have a person who arrives in France and immediately starts teaching himself grammar and making lists of the best historians and the best restaurants and the best source books. And then you have Franklin who realizes that that's not really the way to seduce the people who are dedicated to leisure or at least the appearance of leisure, who are much more graceful and much, and much subtler in their approaches to things. And whom Adams therefore perceives as being um, extremely lazy and, and disengaged mm -hmm. yeah. and will write back constantly to, to, to Congress about that. Yeah. And, and, and then the relationship between Adams and Franklin is cordial compared to the relationship between say Franklin and Ralph Isard or Arthur Lee, who are really troubled people in many ways. You know, I, I wonder what the common denominator here is. And you have to admit, there's really only one colleague with whom Franklin ever gets along in Paris. Um, and that will ultimately be Thomas Jefferson. So yeah. maybe, maybe this has something to do more to do with Franklin than anything else. To, to a great extent, his celebrity really bothers them all. I think mm -hmm. maybe Adams mostly. Um, and, and part of the problem is that Congress, in its attempt to impose some sort of order on the, on the French mission, um, keeps sending people. So that at one point you have, I think, five Americans living in Passy at Franklin's mm -hmm. house, two of them because they have mandates to go to other courts to, to ask for aid, to Vienna and to Tuscany. Um, and in one case, Vienna, no money to get to Tuscany. In the other case, Vienna won't receive the, de the delegate. So you have this kind of household bursting of with people who don't really mm. have anything to do and who don't understand entirely how Franklin is dealing with Versailles. Yeah. Um, but yes, nobody, I don't, I don't think anyone quite expresses himself as brilliantly as does John Adams in his hatred, who, who calls Franklin the love child of the Jesuits and Machiavelli and the greatest yeah. of Mohammed. Yeah. He's so quotable, but the yeah, hatred is, is, is certainly is virulent. It really is. It's visceral. And then Adams makes the point that uh, Franklin doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that his one of his secretaries, Edward Bancroft, is actually a British spy. And Franklin says, well, if my valet is a spy, I'd rather keep him if he's doing a good job as a valet. 
and, Bancro and, and Franklin seems to know this Machiavellian thing that if Bancroft is passing things the Americans are proposing to the British, then the French will think that the Americans might get back with the British unless we play closer to them. So it's a much subtler game that Franklin seems to be playing, I, I think, than is diplomatically prudent. And I think it would be, I think you would say imprudent, but it was sort of the chess move that he chose. I don't think Franklin, as, as insouciant and masterful as he sounds, I don't think he had any idea of how systematically the information was flowing from his desk. I mean, Bancroft literally every Tuesday took the dispatches, which he recopied painstakingly, he would complain that his hand hurt in invisible ink and would carry them to the Tuileries, drop them in a bottle under a tree where they'd be picked up by a British messenger and, and immediately sail off to London. These during the years when Congress rarely heard from Franklin. So there's this perfect system in place to get information to London and Congress is sitting in the dark. Um, and of that, I think Franklin was wholly unaware. And, and, I, and I do think there was a certain distancing himself from his desk because he knew that he was being spied upon. It would be hard to, it would have been hard not to realize it. I mean, you had a, you had a net of French spies who were surrounded by a net of British spies and everyone, they're, they're stumbling over each other. There are so many informers in the picture. At one point, one, is, one steals the dispatches from the other one's wife. There are so many trying desperately to be able to deliver information. Um, but I think John Adams was probably right when he said that Franklin didn't run a very tight ship in that respect. And then, of course, he had brought over his both of his grandsons, and one of them, Temp Temple, becomes a secretary, which is, again, Temple has uh, a, a life that never quite lives up to his grandfather's expectations. And it's apparently something everyone else could see, that Temple really wasn't the stellar individual that his grandfather imagined him to be. And uh, poor Temple. I mean, his father was now uh, had been imprisoned in America. William Franklin, the uh, governor of New Jersey, and then is in London at the end of the war. And Temple, um, in many ways, fills, uh, um, fulfills the what Franklin men had done. As he has an illegitimate daughter, and uh, it, it's but you know Franklin doesn't quite see that Temple Franklin is not the next generation American Franklin. It's a really almost Shakespearean history with the relationships among those three men. I mean, that William should have betrayed his father as, as Franklin saw it and, and become such a fervent loyalist. And, you know, Franklin does write him to say, there are certain things that override our political allegiances and natural duties come first. I mean, he, he, he just inherits him not once, but twice, which is really putting a rather fine point on it. But he essentially takes Temple off almost as a kidnapping, almost as a revenge, I think, um, at least is the way I see it, um, on William. And it's, it's a replacement son, in a way, for the son he had lost to their, to their political convictions. And doesn't, I think, see that by taking Temple off, he's made of him essentially a foreigner. He's made of him a Frenchman. Mm -hmm. And Temple is given to certainly a certain amount of, um, of dissipation in France. There's, there's a definite um, embrace of the aristocratic life. But by the time Temple does come back to America, he's not an American really anymore. And it's a really sort of heartbreaking moment, I think, for Franklin to see that Temple, no one will find a place for Temple. No one will help Temple. No one will recognize any of the, any of really of the hard work that the, that the two of done, them have done in Paris. But the Temple is in particular someone to whom there's an allergy after the French mission. Hmm. That's true. Very interesting. And then William Franklin had been his father's closest confidant for most of his life. And then he chooses loyalty to the crown over what his father then sees as loyalty to him. And it's uh, that, that really is in many ways a tragic story because Will, William and his father are both very stubborn men and both have a lot in common. And then there is this um, break as William remains loyal, and during the negotiations with, among Franklin, Adams, John Jay, Franklin is the most adamant about not conceding anything to the loyalists. And you do have to wonder how much of that was a, was a personal feeling on his front. Um, there's a very sort of poignant episode after the peace when William writes to his father. William's in London at this point, Franklin's in Paris and says, I'd like to come over to see you. And Franklin essentially holds him off. He has no interest in seeing his son. He's not, he's absolutely unforgiving. Um, which for a 70, he must have been what, 78 at that point, year old man is kind of astonishing. Um, and then on the way 
Temple, he does stop in London. And there's a very, very chilly meeting among the three, among Temple, William, and, and Franklin, in which Franklin essentially allows for um, Temple to inherit William's American holdings. But there's no, there's no emotional rapprochement. There's, there's no sense of making a peace. Franklin has really drawn a line in the sand at that point. And which must have been devastating for Temple. I mean, it's very hard to understand how Temple could have run interfered, what have it, could have gone back and forth um, between father and grandfather, two men who were at war with each other. Yeah, really is. And and then you know, Temple's daughter winds up later on caring for her grandfather in his old age, and he says that she reminds him of his father. It's um, really is. It's it's Shakespearean the relationships among these individuals in this oh, um, interesting you know, family. That, that Franklin's, the vitriol of Franklin's reaction is interesting. I mean, if all, all, every peace negotiator, I think, except for John Adams, has loyalist relatives. But Franklin is much more adamant on that subject than was anyone else. I mean, it does feel like it's personal animus that is driving him. When, when the British proposed actually having a colony for loyalists in the American, perhaps in Vermont, and Benjamin Franklin says, we don't choose to have such neighbors. Yeah. It's a, you know, he does Franklin has a, as we're, as we're pointing out, a fairly volcanic temper, or not temper, uh, he, he's, he boils, but we don't know that. We think of him as this imme immensely equi equitable, mm -hmm. even tempered, even killed man. And, and I'm thinking of some of the things he left in his top desk drawer. And I think the secret was that he often committed the anger to paper, but didn't mail the letter. I mean, at one point he makes up a list of people and draws a line through it. And I realized on seeing it that what it is, it's a list of people who betrayed him in various ways. It's people who promised him money or people who sold his secrets. And it, and it's just, he draws, he writes down all the names. It's quite a long inventory. And then he just draws a line through it and puts it right back in the desk drawer. So it's almost a way of expunging this, the animosity without actually doing anything that might be destructive. That's interesting. We're talking with Stacy Schiff, author of A Great Improvisation on Franklin, France and the Birth of America. You know, you can almost see this in the autobiography, which we started off talking about, where he does present this image of this equitable guy, even tempered. I mean, that's one of his uh, 13 virtues is not to be upset at trifles. But then the things he admits to in the autobiography, which he says are errata, that is, in his ne the, the next edition, these will be corrected. You can see there's a struggle maintaining that equanimity. Or it's um, a character trait he is trying to achieve. And, and we have to admit, this is a difficult situation in many ways, negotiating this um, the piece as well as all that's going to come out of it. So. A, we can hold him up to a higher standard because he sets one, but B, we also can acknowledge what an achievement this is for someone of his of any age to be able to pull this off. I'm not sure anyone has ever been so endearing about their errata um, as has yeah. been Franklin, right? Um, and because everything in the autobiography could be used as evidence that he hadn't, uh, none of those right. things are true. Um, but, you know, I think when you, because you mentioned the piece, that's where it, it comes to mind most quickly and that, Franklin had sworn he would, you know, cut off his hand rather than make peace without the French. Those were the terms that the French mm -hmm. and the Americans, when it came time to settle with Great Britain, would do so in unison. And in the end, that's not what happens. The Americans exceed their orders and they negotiate with the with the British and they don't tell Vergen, the French foreign minister, until afterwards, which was precisely not what was indicated. And the mission to go to Versailles and to explain to Vergen Oops, we, we made a little mistake, yeah. um, just a little mistake. It falls to Franklin, um, the man who had sworn this would never happen. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you can see him there. He's he, he's realizing this was the only way to proceed. The Americans, moreover, have, have managed extraordinary terms. But he's the one who has to explain it. And how does he choose to explain it? This immensely sophisticated man basically says to the French foreign minister, oh, we were just babes in the woods. We didn't really know what we were doing. You know, we were naive. Oh, just forgive us. Yeah. You know, it just seems to me as if that's Franklin at his best in terms of dealing with the mistakes or dealing really with them. just go awry and you really can't do anything about them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is really a, it's a masterful negotiation in many ways. And we do wonder how much of this is, as we were saying before, is this clearly thought out or is this an improv? You say it is an improvisation. That is, we are really learning as we go along. But um was, was it Franklin the chess master at work, or was it Franklin the babe in the woods? Who's, uh... I think it's definitely chess mastery, 
but I think it's a group effort. I mean, I think John Adams takes an enorm- plays an enormous role there. And that is the one episode where the two of them really clearly respect each other. There's mm-hmm. immense respect there among 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 the across the entire team and it's just an all-star lineup really it really is um but i think the striking thing there as with much of these eight and a half years is the problem with communication i mean these mm-hmm. men are negotiating a piece without really any ability to communicate with congress almost everything that franklin tries to send back ends up either in says back in terms of envelopes either ends up on the ocean floor or in great britain it very rarely makes its way to congress so I mean, it's an improvisation in the sense that there's they're untethered from the mothership in some way, mm-hmm. and it's an improvisation in the sense that this has never happened before. I mean, there's this is a this is the first in his in in so many ways, mm-hmm. and just the fact that they have managed or that we have managed um, to found a republic thanks to a monarchy, um, mm-hmm. you know, must be trailing them around. It's such an astonishing feat. It really is. Um, Another person we should talk briefly about is Voltaire, whom Franklin meets um, a few years into his tenure there. And Voltaire come, returns to Paris from a long exile in Geneva. And he, most celebrated French man, French man of letters, wants to meet Dr. Franklin, which I think tells us something about Franklin's status in this world. When, when, when the French Revolution begins and you have sort of a triumvirate of figures, it will be Voltaire, Rousseau, and Franklin. Which is which is the piece that doesn't fit there, um, but indeed Voltaire comes back. Um, I think he's eighty three or eighty four. He's extremely frail, and Franklin makes a sort of well publicized pilgrimage to Voltaire's bedroom. In fact, with Temple in tow, and he'll introduce Temple to the great Voltaire. Voltaire will pull out his rusty English, um, and Voltaire will bless Temple. And I think he mm. says God and liberty, which yes. I. I believe is a is a stamp that Temple will later use on his letters, or will recycle it later in some sort of pompous way, which speaks of, says a great deal about Temple. And then there's a, a kind of astonishing meeting of the two of them, these sort of two monuments, Voltaire and Franklin, um, at an Academy of Sciences meeting, where the room erupts to have these two celebrities mm-hmm. in their midst, and essentially Franklin realizes that he's being called upon to they're being called upon to embrace, and so you have this embrace of these mm-hmm. two. I mean, it's, it's as if Socrates and Homer were to meet or something, these right. you know, two living marvels. Um, and the room just goes wild. But, mm. but yes, it speaks very much to um, how much Franklin has inherited the Enlightenment mantle and how he uses that, and also just how difficult it must have been for him to walk around France. I mean, people are lining up in stairwells and you know, goes to the theater and people applaud not for the, for the spectacle, but for him. It's really amazing. And, and then he's also in Paris for the first ascension of hot air balloons, which become a real spectacle in the early 1780s. So. He plays, he's lucky in the sense that, you know, Franklin used to always say that, um, that he was born too, too soon. And in the, end, in the end of the day in France, he gets to witness two sort of extraordinary displays, one of hot air balloons and the other of the Mesmer experiments with, mm. with Mesmer. Right. The ballooning in particular just completely captures his fancy for every for every possible reason. And even though he is hobbled at that point by gout, um, he does go off to watch an ascent of the balloons, which must have been extraordinary to him. Um, but he's, you know, this is a man who's experimenting. Even on his trip back to North America, he's still experimenting with, yes. with currents in the water. He's ever curious about everything. And with yes. Mesmer, he's put on a commission to see if, to determine whether the Mesmer experiments are actually... Can you tell us briefly what the Mesmer experiments were? It's essentially a form of hypnotism. Um, And Franklin is, and 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 everyone is in a a sort of, I don't know, tarot card type way. Everyone is obsessed with these experiments. Um, And Mesmer is an extremely good salesman for his brand of Mm -hmm. um, hypnosis. And Franklin is put on this commission to essentially observe the experiments and then advise the government as to whether there is anything legitimate in Mesmer's investigations. Um, and he's extremely noncommittal in a very diplomatic way. This is Franklin at his diplomatic best, mm-hmm. very noncommittal as to um, whether there's any truth to these things or not. So is there truth in Mesmerism? Uh, <laughs> I haven't been mesmerized lately. So there seems <laughs> 
there seems to be a lot of people, especially among Franklin's inner circle, who are convinced that there was truth to Mesmerism. Oh, yeah. 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 It's really phenomenal. So this is all in uh, Stacey Schiff's wonderful book, A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America. And it, uh, it's a great subject. This uh, A, Franklin is always interesting. And then B, this negotiation in Paris between 1776 and 1785. It's really an extraordinary period. Is there anything else we should talk about before we um, say I goodbye? Guess- the only thing we could just say is that without that episode, without that chapter of Franklin's life, there would probably not have been an America. I mean, I think we should, we should probably underline how much support, mm-hmm. um, despite despite everything John Adams did have to say, um, the material, the munitions, the funding that Franklin does manage to have, manage to extract from this are what makes the revolution possible. And there are those, you know, Yorktown is indeed a, a triumph of two armies and a French naval force, um, mm-hmm. much of what Franklin's doing, which I think we tend to forget because we'd rather think about it as George Washington's doing. Right, but it is the uh, French Navy that is there at Yorktown. And it's also, it's hard to imagine anyone else uh, bringing in the French in the way that Franklin was able to, and having a king. And you know, when um, Turgot, I think, coins that Latin motto about he sees lightning from the heavens and the scepter from the tyrant. And this is brandished about in the king. You can imagine Louis XVI, how he feels about people seizing scepters from tyrants. He's Which, which makes you realize what an extraordinary job of diplomacy this was on Franklin's part. And when he does meet the king, he says something almost treasonous. Because he meets the king when he's first, when, when the um, alliance is first realized, and essentially says if if more monarchs governed with your principles, sir, republics would never be formed. I mean, not exactly the message Congress had sent him to impart. No. But, but, a very uh, but again, he, he knows his audience. Exactly. He could read a room. Exactly. Yeah. We've been talking with Stacy Sheff, author of A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America, a great book. And uh, thank you so much for sharing so much of it, enticing us now into being mesmerized again by this tremendous story. So I want to thank Stacy for joining us. And I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and all of our many listeners around the world in um, 100 cities and eight countries and, and more. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jonathan.